Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. This is Guides Day Friday, where we speak with a guide, lodge, or outfitter to spotlight their business and the amazing achievements they've made within the fly fishing world through conservation and dedication to the sport of fishing. But first, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast or joined our email list, please do so by going to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast.com or also find us on Instagram at Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Welcome to Guides Day Friday. Today, our guest is Brian Niska from Skeenis Bay. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here again. Yeah, no worries. Well, we always like you coming back. So why don't we just jump right to it? Can you tell us a bit about your operations at the lodge? Uh, you bet. So Skeenis Bay is located just outside of Terrace. We're just upstream, uh, kind of in the vicinity of the, the mouth of the copper. We've got 10 acres right on the Kina, a bunch of cabins here that we rent out. What's unique about this particular fishing lodge would be, you know, we don't do set weeks. So we don't have a situation where everyone arrives on a Sunday, leaves on a Saturday, and we sell five-day five day fishing packages. Rather, you know, we have people who are here for one night. We have we do day trips. We have people who are here for three weeks. Uh, not all of our guests have to go guided every day. Sometimes, especially people on longer stays, will mix in uh, a, a day or two of either unguided fishing or just straight up rest days or in other situations, especially in the summer. And we do get a lot of families and couples, you know, a lot of times people take a break from fishing and they, uh, they go to Prince Rupert or, or they go up Smithers and, and check things out north of here up to the, the lava beds. Mm-hmm. They, the other thing that's really popular in the summer would be whale watching out in Prince Rupert. So yeah, there's a variety of things that people can do when they're here on vacation. Last year we had people who were golfing as well as, uh, as fishing. So that was pretty cool. So just kind of answer my next question. What, what can guests expect uh, when engaged with your business fishing wise walk me through an average day yeah so you know we, we play to the conditions a little bit but generally speaking breakfasts at seven dinners at seven sometimes 7 30 uh, if we have a situation where it's really hot out last year it was you know 37 degrees then you know sometimes we get a much earlier start but overall it's a pretty civilized fishing day as far as what time on the water hopefully what people would find is very attentive knowledgeable fishing guides who are focused on improving the, the guests level of skill and also able to provide you know other information about the area meaning it's not just a situation of spending the day talking about fishing if people want to learn more about the flora and the fauna the guides are knowledgeable in that regard too Brian what are the amenities like at the lodge uh, you bet we think it's pretty comfortable our favorite type of business would be couples and families and we wanted to make the cabins as comfortable for people who aren't necessarily diehard anglers you know you got bathtubs on demand gas hot water heaters lots of space in the cabins brand new beds so it's i think it's the most comfortable accommodations in steelhead country but you know certainly for us the the big thing that we try and do is make the entry into the world of steelheading as comfortable as possible for people our philosophy has always been about trying to create new anglers versus you know just trying to convince those that are already coming to lodges to come to us instead we'd rather uh, rather create new business and, and it's worked out well and certainly that a scheduling scenario where we'll take any length of trip has really worked in our favor because a lot of times it's not about the money, it's about the time. And not everybody can get dedicate seven solid days to fishing, especially if they're coming from a long ways away and they need a, a day or two of travel on either end. You, you want to hit the ground running. The, I think probably our most popular trip is people coming for four nights and three days. That seems like a, a good amount of fishing for people. They stretch it out over a weekend. You know, so as far as the fishing goes, we're super lucky because we have a really long season. So we start at the beginning of March, well, kind of second week of March. That would be winter steelhead season. And that will run through until early May. And towards the end of April, we start running into early run Chinook salmon most years. And then we, we tend to take a little bit of a break in May for high water. We'll get back at it in mid-June as the river starts to drop. And once again, that would be Chinook salmon season. By the time we get to mid-July, start to see some steelhead in the mix. Last year, mid-July was actually really some of the best fishing, if not the best fishing we had all season. You know, August is a real popular time. That's kind of the peak of steelhead run running through the lower Skeena most years. September is the classic time of year to come. Everybody wants to come in September. You know, leaves are just starting to turn. It's a little crisp in the morning, but you still have a hint of summer weather. October is a, a funny one because October can be kind of miserable weather-wise. It can be not snowing, but not snowing, but kind of like towards the end of the month, sort of trying to snow. Like it's snowing like at 1,500 feet above, but you know, it's raining sideways. But the people that come in October tend to really like it. And, and that's actually the time of year where folks tend to come back and want to go at the exact same time the following year. And I think part of what makes October so exciting, the fish are sitting in the runs more. So in August, the, the fish are really moving fast. They're, they're coming up. You know, in a lot of cases, they've, they've got a ways to go, whether they're destined for the Maurice, the Kispiox, the Babine, uh, the Sustat. 
you know, they've got, they've got places to be. They're on the move. Whereas the fish that come in from the ocean, they've stayed out there a little bit longer in October. They tend to sit in the runs and be pretty aggressive. Generally speaking, the river is going to be a little bit lower. And we tend to have very memorable encounters in October. You know, this seems to be a time of year when a fish grabs someone's dry fly and just, you know, takes all their line and we never really get square with the fish. So certainly way less fish around in October, but I believe it's the average size is a little bigger and I would say definitely quality over quantity. But certainly that's you could describe steelhead fishing up here that way anytime. We don't we don't focus on numbers. We we celebrate the encounters. Uh, a good day of fishing is you get a couple chances. If you spread it out over the week, sometimes we find that, you know, you, you might have a day or two where not much happens, but you might have a couple of days where, you're, you know, there was a lot of activity, but that's steelhead fishing. And especially this scenario where we're so close to the ocean, the fish are coming in fresh. There's not always fish in front of you, but when there is, they tend to be really aggressive because there's not a lot of pressure. They're nice and bright, strong as can be. Certainly the, the privilege of fishing for them in the Esquina, which is a, for those that haven't been here, is a quite a wide river, but, you know, not particularly deep. So a good fish will get a long ways away on you very quick. You know, a lot of times they're in the air and, and the whole the whole encounter can be a little more than people are used to if they're, you know, if they're steelheading in, in other places where the, the water's not quite so big and the fish aren't quite so fresh. Brian, what's port look like for this year from what you can see? Oh, you never know. You never know. We had a great, we had a great year last summer, uh, summer and fall, but we also were blessed with really incredible water conditions. So that, mm-hmm. that really helps our taste. But you'll have some winter steelhead fishing here whenever we get warm, wet weather. So whenever you get a, a high freezing level and a bit of rain, you're going to see a few fresh fish come in. So the folks that you know have just been fishing throughout the winter months have had decent fishing whenever the conditions were right. But it's been kind of a funny, funny winter because at times it's felt really mild and then it switches up and it's minus 15 plus wind chill. So, you know, today the river's caked in ice. Hopeful that the forecast is correct and we have some warmer weather coming this week. You know, certainly at this point, it still feels pretty wintry here. And because of that, you know, there hasn't been much fishing happening in the last last month, I would say. You know, from one year to the next, the spring fishing is, you know, I think it's a lot of work compared to, to the summer and the fall. The folks that come here and fish, regardless of whether it's March or April, they come here with the expectation that they're going to work pretty hard to find those fish, but the fish quality is off the charts and the opportunity to fish the Skeena, people that fish in March, man, it's ice on the sides of the river and the river's as low and clear as you'll ever see it. And we catch those fish on really shallow, really shallow water. And a lot of times, you know, you're seeing a wave chase your fly and you can fish dry flies as the water starts to warm. So it's a really exciting fishery, but it's certainly not an easy fishery, especially when you take into account the water temperature. It's going to be cold. It might snow. Probably going to be windy. If it's not snowing, it might rain. So I think there is maybe something that's kind of charming for a lot of folks that really love winter stealing of having to put the work in kind of this communal idea of communal suffering where at the end of the day everyone comes back and they're soaked and cold and they've made a lot of casts and you know maybe have some good stories to tell but then they get to hang out in the sauna or sit in the hot tub and have a good meal so i think that the folks that like winter steelheading are a special bunch and they seem to really like it a lot definitely well said brian i know you're one of the guides there what's your favorite part about guiding what i enjoy about guiding i think is the unexpected meaning you know most of the time you expect that you're going to make a lot of casts and not much is going to happen. But when you have these crazy encounters and the fish just goes ballistic from out of nowhere, you know, the guest is visibly shaken up by the whole thing in a good way. From a guiding standpoint, that's quite a high. And if you can manage, for those that are interested in a career steelhead guiding, if you can manage the lows for you, you know, the days when there's not much happening, if you can find ways to make those enjoyable, both for yourself and your guests, then you're winning. The easiest way that we do that is through trying to improve people's casting skill, try and make them a more efficient angler so that when they do get those opportunities in front of them, they don't squander them. And that's a big deal because, you know, if you think of it this way, regardless of wherever you're you're fishing for winter steelhead, you know, you're going to work pretty hard to get those chances. And those chances you know, okay, so you found a fish, right? If the client lifts up really quickly when the fish goes to get the fly, it doesn't allow the fish to take the fly and turn with it, that chance has been essentially squandered. Now, if the angler doesn't screw it up, if the guide does a good job of coaching them and that ends up with a fish in the net, that was essentially the same thing. They found a fish, but the outcome's, you know, much different. So a lot of times, hey, it's out of your control and the fish jumps and it comes off. It's an equally good story to landing it, but you hate to see those opportunities squandered by people trout setting or, you know, people moving too quickly 
quickly through a particular piece of water. Or the, the other big one is, remember, we're dealing with kind of cold water. So a lot of times before fish climb right on the fly, they'll show some level of interest. So the angler will get a little bit of a bump, say. You know, those that are experienced in the game, or at least well coached, will say, hey, you know, something just happened there. You know, I recognize that that was different. And because of that, I'm going to tell the guide, hey, I think I had a bump. The guide's going to get right in there and say, okay, well, let's rest it for a minute. We'll make another cast. We'll change the fly. We'll do whatever. Put a little bit of effort in because you both have the confidence to know that there's a fish there. Now, if you don't have that confidence, if you're like, oh man, I'm not catching anything and maybe it was a leaf or my imagination, you're going to keep casting, keep stepping. And that potential chance has essentially been squandered, but you're none the wiser. I think confidence is a big part of it. And a good quality for a guide to have is the ability to have confidence and spread it to the client so that they are fishing effectively. Because man, that's what you're still heading here. You're fishing the fly properly, but if, if the fish isn't there, you're not going to catch them. And sometimes you can be doing everything wrong and you still catch the fish. But you know, certainly our goal with the, the clients that come through our door is that they leave a higher level of skill and a better sense of appreciation for the task at hand. And, and certainly I think if you're into winter steelheading, you enjoy the act of fishing rather than you know reeling a fish in. The, the encounters are exciting because you put a lot of effort into them. And when people start thinking about numbers, maybe they come from another fishery where you expect to catch a bunch of fish throughout the day. Um, and they, they try and sort of take that experience, apply it to their winter steelheading. It, it doesn't tend to, to, to work out for them because winter steelheading is such a mental exercise. You're you got to believe every cast. And, and honestly, the longer you go without a fish, you know, let's say you went three days without Going a fish. Going three days without a fish. Okay. So you, but then, you, but then something happens and you catch a fish. It can trigger a crazy mm-hmm. emotional response with people. I've seen, I've seen big grown men, you know, get all emotional, kind of break into tears because they finally caught a fish after working so hard and they didn't think it would ever happen. And, you know, I, I think that's maybe the high of guiding rather than what I described before is just seeing, um, seeing the emotional response it gets from people. And I'll tell you, like, because because of our flexibility on our schedule, we've got guests that come here multiple times per year. And I think that's somewhat unique. I got one example is a gentleman from Alberta we love. He was here four times last year. He did winter, early summer, late summer, and fall. That's winning, right? I think if you can if you can set up a scenario where where people want to experience, you know, the ski at different times of the year, because it, it's dramatically different. I mean, fishing in late July, early August, and it's over 30 and you're wet waiting versus coming to see us in the third week of March when you're wearing all the fishing clothes that you own. Yeah, it's two totally different experiences. And, you know, for myself, you know, living up here, I think that that's kind of a a really neat thing is that the spring and the fall in particular. So right now, you got, I won't say you have a hint of spring in the air, but y- you sense that it's coming soon. And spring is the sweet zone. The air starts to smell really good. It's warm during the day. You know, then summer comes and, you know, you got these super long days and then fall is back. And fall here seems to last like four months. It seems like four months of fall is from the first hint of it in late August, early September till it really sets in and or till winter really sets in in December sometime, you know, it's, it's a pretty sweet zone. So I think that for those that are considering a skiing trip, it doesn't have to happen in September. September is obviously the popular time that everyone wants to come up here, but you've got a lot of options and, and each of them, I think, have their own unique aspects. Yeah, just to clear that up, I'm sure the skiing is beautiful year round. So Brian, I do have a question for you. Guests that are coming to the lodge, they and they don't have the enough equipment or the right equipment. I know uh, the lodge offers some equipment. Can you touch base on some of the rods that you are currently offering? You bet. And I think that's a trend for people that want to travel light. We um, we have a, a huge fleet of, of brand new Sims waiting gear, and we've got a bunch of pure away rods. Uh, we've got a bunch of reels here, uh, some hatch stuff, some Einerson stuff. So, you know, folks can show up here in their street clothes and we can outfit them. It's no problem at all. Before I let you go, do you have any specials for our listeners today? Yeah, I think uh, what we've talked about doing in, in conjunction with your podcast would be a three-night, two-day stay. So this is three nights accommodation. This would include everybody's meals. This is for two people. They're going to share one of our deluxe cabins. They're going to spend two full days on the water, guided fishing, getting some instruction, and they're going to get one of the, they're each going to get one of the brand new six piece uh, Pureway 675 grain rod. Awesome, Brian. I'm going to make sure I put all the details in the show notes and whatnot. I know I've paired up with that opportunity. You do have uh, four of those trips available as well, one per season sort of, and I'll put all that in the show notes. But before I let you go, where can we find you at, Brian? You bet. So uh, our website is skinaspay.com. Um, Instagram, you can find us at, at Skeena Spay Fishing. Thanks for being our guest on the show today. Hey, Greg, it was my pleasure. And uh, if anyone has questions uh, about Skeena, anything like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk fishing. 